إذا الأستاذ الدكتور حمودة صالحي درس الترجمة ولديه ماستر في اللسانيات ودكتوراه في الدراسات الترجمية وهو مؤسس مشروع الترجمان الترجمان بروجكت وهذا المشروع يعني يعنى بتدريب الترجمة وأيضا بالبحث وهو أيضا مشرف على برنامج الماستر للترجمة والترجمة الشفوية في جامعة تونس المنار فأستاذ أقدم إليك الكلمة وسوف أنشر مداخلتك بعد ثوان شكرا جزيلا ربما أدعو السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهل الجزائر الحبيبة وأهل الأرض الآخرين الحاضرين معنا السيدة الدكتورة عديلة بن عودة الدكتورة إلهام بزاوشة الدكتورة إيمان محمودي والدكتورة صابرين رميلة والدكتور فوزي بالعالية أشكركم جزيلا شكرا موصولا وقد أسعدني على الدعوة لطيفة وقد فعلا أسعدني قبولها قبولا حسنا ويشرفني الآن إلقاء هذه المحاضرة تشريفا أولا أرجو أن الصوت يصل وصولا حسنا على الرغم من أننا كنا نود أن يكون اللقاء لقاء حضوريا وجاهيا فأولا أريد أن أتأكد من أن الصوت يصل جيدا مئة في المئة جزيلا. صوت واضح شكرا. إليك الكلمة تفضل شكرا جزيلا So I'm going to speak into English now Thank you very much uh, and, and good morning to you all uh, Ladies and gentlemen uh, Dear colleagues, dear students, dear friends uh, Again I wish to thank the Institute of Translation At the University of uh, Algiers too And the organizing committee For inviting me to this conference and for giving me the uh, opportunity to talk about about my experience with interpreting uh, and translation both as a researcher but most importantly as a practitioner as a professional uh, interpreter and professional translator i also wish to extend my thanks to you Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, for attending this talk either directly on this uh, platform or through the live stream. And I am aware that there is a live stream. And I wish to invite you all to uh, share your thoughts, knowledge, and expertise uh, in this subject. I invite you to uh, take part in the discussion later on perhaps and in the uh, on, on the chat box to uh, take part actively by reporting on your own experiences with regard to the arguments and the uh, examples i'm going to put forward and discuss here i would like to also to learn from your own experiences uh, Uh, the, uh, and to learn from your diverse backgrounds, languages and experiences. Because some of the examples or some of the arguments I'm going to uh, investigate might be controversial to some extent. Uh, you know, the, 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 the topic or, or, or the subject of this conference and the subject of my talk and the talk of my uh, predecessors, the guest speakers, Uh, is uh, really very important. I, I would like to hide that importance. Uh, the, the subject of language, translation, uh, uh, culture, diplomacy, and, 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 and because uh, th th these are now being studied on the shifting ground of world politics uh, and across A, an ever-changing landscape of international relations between states, states of peace, coup d'etat, uh, wars, civil wars, uh, pandemics, revolutions, and so on and so forth. So the subject of my talk uh, is about an area at the crossroads of, as I said, language, 
linguistics, pragmatics, culture, translation, and interpreting. I'm going to talk to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, or afternoon, depending on where you are, or even evening, uh, about interpreting as cross-cultural diplomacy. And here my uh, definition of diplomacy is not the conventional uh, concept of uh, and uh, conceptualization of diplomacy because diplomacy uh, diplomacy's meaning and concept is uh, it is um, so this is the uh, st uh, structure of my talk uh, speaking uh, about uh, uh, the 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 uh, way how interpreters are acting as diplomats, interpreters as cultural clarifiers, uh, interpreters as messengers of peace, interpreters as negotiators in business deals. Uh, but sometimes interpreters are being called to testify, compelled to testify. And here uh, there is a very famous case. I'm going to report on it later on. And the second chapter would be uh, about the visibility and invisibility and powerfulness and powerlessness of interpreters uh, and about the judicious intervention that interpreters sometimes are allowed to uh, to intervene in the in the meaning and add uh, a spin of their own culture so this is above language level, but the stakes are also taking place at language level because language is tricky uh, and the interpreter is required to have and acquire a skill of adaptation and more particularly a magic to bring about a magic remedy. And I will finish this presentation by a message interpreting in conclusion. But before that, I would like to invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to try your hands at these expressions and utterances, which have been extracted from real conferences, real life conferences and texts. First, I'll think about it. Second, your excellency or your excellencies. Third, with a push and a shove. Four, great power competition. Five, the Mujahideen of the Islamic State. Six, the world's most powerful men. And seven, a Nakba. Eight, a Sheikh. Nine, uh, imprisoning women for defying the wishes of men. Ten, what refugees face on their treacherous journey. 11. Irda'an lil militiati wa khidmatan li ahdafi Erdogan. 12. Refugees risked everything to make this treacherous journey. 13. Supreme Court has struck down the death sentence for blasphemy. 14. Comfort women. 15. Maximum security prison. 16. At tahaqq min sahat al iddiaat. 17. Strange political mouthings, lies, and fabrications. 18. Had the blood of the Palestinians killed in Sheikh Jarrah. And uh, and 19. Erez crossing. 20. Resolution. So, interpreters as diplomats, modern diplomacy is currently experiencing fundamental changes on an unprecedented rate. Diplomacy does not pertain to diplomats only. It also pertains to judicial, security, military, religious leaders, and other community leaders and officials as well. Interpreting in diplomatic settings is often complex in that it involves a wide range of linguistic, pragmatic, discursive, cultural, psychological, uh, and, and other protocol elements and factors that make communication possible.
And here I'm really very happy to speak about Cecilia and James because they laid the foundation for me uh, to speak about other things because they have covered uh, uh, most of the elements uh, and factors required and the conditions working in diplomatic settings. So the interpreters who are invisible most of the time in a dimly lit uh, booth, in most cases, they, they, they actively participate in turbulent peace talks, transitional justice reforms, and public hearings of victims uh, of violations of human rights, for example, and actively participate in war crime trials like the Nuremberg trials, or in somewhat calmer trade negotiations and in all other kinds of uh, international meetings. Their presence is crucial at important gatherings uh, of diplomats who are attempting to subtle international disputes or to mediate uh, some uh, uh, problems and difficulties, especially in contexts now in the Arab world that is uh, facing uh, enormous challenges, mediation in Libya, mediation in Sudan, mediation uh, in uh, Yemen, in Syria, and so on, and, and even in Tunisia. So in their own way, through a language skill, through an intercultural competence, interpreters contribute to world harmony. Interpreters in diplomacy can uh, prove very rewarding as interpreters feel that they uh, are giving their small sometimes tiny contribution to history in the making uh, but sometimes you do not act or you are called not to act only as an interpreter as a human being as a part of an exchange or a communication. You are a human being. And interpreters, despite the fact that this is controversial and uh, most of the codes of ethics, they uh, perhaps warn some interpreters not to go the extra mile and act as a, a cultural advisor and stick to what has been said, but sometimes to stick to what has been said might uh, might not serve the communication ends. And here is one example. There is a, a story that is uh, in the literature about President Nixon of the United States of America who received and welcomed Emperor Hirohito. And during personal negotiations, President Nixon asked Emperor Hirohito one question and the emperor at one point responded to a, th this question by saying i will think about it i will think about it and the interpreter translated it literally i will think about it but the interpreter in this case should have made it very clear to mr nixon that this answer uh, translated as no, knowing the Japanese culture. Since this was not done, the result was a misunderstanding, as what was not serving communication, as I said, and produced some resentment later on. Japanese people, like Oriental people in general, and including Arab people, they really find it very offensive to say no Arab people might say, Inshallah. Inshallah. And here we keep on, in Tunisia, in the Tunisian context, we keep on joking about the word Inshallah because it has at least 20 meanings depending on the intonation. When you say, Inshallah means no, or Inshallah, yes, I confirm, and so on and so forth. And here, I have a testimony. I have conducted a research a while ago and interviewed some officials 
And I would like also to come closer to the speakers and the officials to uh, have fresh insights into their perspective of communication. This is really very helpful for the interpreter, whether uh, the interpreter has to measure uh, it before getting into that uh, f uh, or acquiring that freedom or that, that, that power has to be granted that power first. Uh, so uh, interpreters can act as cultural clarifiers. Uh, interpreting has long been regarded as cultural assimilation. And here I would like to invite uh, my colleague and friend, Dr. Belaiba, to uh, display the first audio testimony, the role of the interpreter as a cultural advisor, the example of the bread. The example of the bread here, if you uh, do not intervene as an interpreter, quite I, to me. Uh, we were involved in an yes, exercise please, in the police. Please go ahead, yes. In an exercise in the police camp, uh, and we were trying to encourage the students to, to chase us uh, as we were playing the role of, of being riders. I saw what I assumed was a, a, a stale piece of bread sitting on a wall. I picked it up and I threw it at the shields of the, the police officers to try and encourage them to chase me and the whole event just stopped and I could hear a lot of the language coming that I knew I'd done something wrong uh, and I realised then through the interpreter that you know this was a cultural issue uh, in Tunisia and any pieces of bread are left for small animals to try and encourage them that it's a blessing if you do help feed these animals so through the interpreter again I apologise to the guys uh, I was unaware of this uh, and these things can happen and without the interpreter there to smooth the waters for me again will then it be hard for me to interact with the students. So, so this is the role of the interpreter as a cultural clarifier, as a cultural advisor. So I would like to invite you also to play the other audio testimony, the example of Mohammed. Please. Okay, I, I will. Thank one you. second. Tunisia about culture and cultural differences and if you may um, just uh, show the role that an interpreter for example has play, played here in Tunisia. Uh, I know certainly I am when we first come to the country um, I was responsible for uh, training the trainers uh, with regards to adult education and one of the things I was trying to convey to them was how to use a case study uh, now, one of the examples I gave, because I wanted to keep it local, was that I used the expression, Mohammed steals a car. And I said to the interpreter, this is the expression I'm going to use about case studies. And he stopped me and said, no, uh, change the name from Mohammed, because the people in the classroom might find it very offensive that you're using the name Mohammed. Uh, now, for me, it's a common name. Uh, I would not have seen the fact that that could potentially cause offence. So had I not been corrected at that very early stage, it could have meant that we could have got off on the wrong foot with our students. So uh, yes, uh, in the age of poaching liquidity, enforced migration and overwhelming globality, in the age of uh, bitter armed conflicts and worldwide pandemics, forms of struggle and move, movements of resistance, um, mediation negotiations and hence expressions have started to slough of their very local nature and started to, to be transferred uh, or uh, to, to uh, and, and, and mediators started to transfer uh, these uh, excessively culture bound skin across the bridge of translation and interpreting by old mediators, old mediators, namely diplomatic translators and uh, interpreters. Through language, intercultural competence again, and other skills certainly, translators and interpreters have acted over history as messengers of peace, exactly like diplomats, facilitating negotiations and inclusion through the transfer of uh, those local needs and cultural experiences and expressions over the bridge of understanding, acculturation and cooperation.
Last summer, I gave a talk on uh, interpreters and judges in judicial cooperation, the search for common ground, and I invite you to watch it later on. So interpreters are also crucial in commercial negotiations. And here I would like to invite uh, Dr. Fauzi or Safa to share the last video. Thank you very much. Yes. You can, have, you can have the best project in the world, but if you don't have the best interpreter in the world, you won't be able to sell your product. The other evidence that interpreters can act as diplomats is the perception of interpreters by others, by the participants in a communication. And here the evidence is that sometimes they are called to testify. You all know and aware of the very famous case of the U.S. Congress Democrats. Democrats are the U.S. Congress who compelled the Russian interpreter to testify. That took place in 2018. There was an attempt by the Democrats in the U.S. Con Congress to subpoena the State Department's in Russian interpreter who worked in close uh, door meetings between President Trump and uh, President Putin. They hoped to obtain some undisclosed content of what was discussed through uh, her testimony and notes. So, uh, although this never materialized, but still this raised a very uh, good question about the role of interpreters uh, and uh, the discussion of uh, the codes of ethics. Again here, the AIC stood firm against uh, the interpreters being brought or compelled to testify. Now I move on to the uh, question of invisibility and the power uh, or visibility and the power that can be granted to interpreters. Top-ranking interpreters are well aware of their own worth. Oftentimes they venture liberties, uh, they grant themselves liberties uh, that lesser experienced interpreters uh, would not dare. Uh, here there is a story uh, of an English language interpreter who was interpreting for Adolf Hitler and other world leaders. So whenever anyone at the conference uh, became excited and uh, talked too fast, this interpreter did not hesitate to intervene and uh, restore order uh, in a way by reminding the participants and the world leaders that he could not process uh, a certain limit of, of words. So in by the way, that room uh, where the uh, proceedings took place was called uh, the uh, by one of the um, participants, uh, uh, the uh, schoolmaster, uh, the, the schoolroom, uh, uh, because uh, the interpreter who was at that time Dr. Um, Paul Schmidt was described as a schoolmaster, bringing his people to order and curb uh, unruly peoples. So high level and experienced interpreters exert a certain power uh, in, the, in, the, in the practicing of their, of their profession. And here, judicial intervention is required uh, in the profession such as the example of, I will think about it. Although their skill uh, are linguistic and intercultural uh, to a large extent, uh, and, and that their main role is to facilitate communication, interpreters are far more than simple carriers of meaning and relayers of speech. This power stems from the considerable credibility enjoyed by the competent, reputable, neutral and impartial interpreters. But again I'm going to discuss this at world, uh, at, at, at language level. Uh, here 
language is really tricky. And this requires the skill of adaptation and the magic remedy to be brought by the interpreter. Uh, may I ask Safa to please stop sharing the screen because I would like to be in interaction with the participants. Despite the fact that language is tricky, it offers magic remedies for its users. And interpreters are uh, some of the users. Uh, take the following examples. When I say, on va être en retard, how to translate that to an English speaker in a diplomatic setting? With some judicial, judicious intervention, I can translate it as, we are going to be a little late. So I add little, a little late. Or a Tunisian official stating, sometimes directly, I might translate it also in this particular context. Uh, that might not work this way. That might, and I add the might. So here, these are required also to smooth the waters and not to be very sometimes offensive. Languages are also based on universal on a universal human experience that is offering many common denominators between their respective cultures. Interpreters and translators can still look for and rely on those commonalities. Let's take just one example, like uh, remedy, for example. I found out that many proverbs coming from different languages and cultures and different experiences, uh, they share the same message, sharing the same message. And here there is a slide about remedy. Can here? I would like. Uh, can you please share the slide, Safa? Please. Yes. Uh, here, some remedies are worse than the disease. A Roman proverb for extreme ills, extreme remedies. Italian proverb: cauterization is the last remedy. An Arabic proverb, as you know, آخر الطب الكي وهو يضرب به هذا المثل يضرب في آخر ما يعالج به بعد اليأس. Four, if there is no remedy, why worry? A Spanish proverb. Five, adapt the remedy to the disease. Chinese proverb. And four, great evils, strong remedies. A Dutch proverb. Thank you. The language, the, the intervention of the interpreter and translator is language-based and culture-driven. And it is, uh, it is, in a way, conducting some sort of diplomacy and mediation. I'm going to investigate this topic by the discussion of the translation and interpreting of utterances extracted, as I said, from real life conferences and texts. Let me start by the translation of honorary titles. Honorary titles are really complex, and Arabic is rich in modes of address. Honorary titles differ greatly across the social, religious, the political hierarchies. Take the example of Your Excellency. How would you translate it? If you have an ambassador, you'd say Sa'adat al-Safir. If there are excellencies, for example, I may rush in simultaneous interpreting Ashab al-Fakhama wal Ma'ali wa Sa'ada wa Hakada. A title used to refer to high ranking officials. Now diplomats are we we we, we address diplomats uh, with her Excellency or His Excellency, Presidents of re Republics, most ambas ambassadors, high commissioners, permanent representatives, and so on. In the judiciary, we tend to use honorable, honorable judge, or sometimes your Excellency, uh, or your honor in Australia. In, it is really fascinating to know that, for example, in Jordan, um, 
judges are addressed عطوفتك, عطوفة القاضي. So here we adapt the form of address to the context. The monarchies, your majesty, royal highness, uh, in case of al-amir, in Arabic is Jalalat al-Malik, sumu al-amir, uh, amir al-mu'mineen fi sabaq uh, and even in, now in Morocco. Uh, so religious, his holiness, the pope, qadasat al-baba, wa hakada. Uh, and the grand ayatullah, uh, ayatullah al-Khumayni, now I'm going to discuss some examples from real conferences and texts with a Puchenda Ashav. So here describing what happened in Sudan recently, whether it is a coup d'etat or not. A Puch is not a coup d'etat uh, and the army is taking over. The army is taking over um, in, in, in Sudan. Uh, Jihad, jihadism and great power competition are behind the rising coups. Here I would like to uh, investigate the word competition. And here there is some sort of culture here that we need to discuss. A putsch is now, that is different from a coup in the sense that a coup is quicker and highly successful act. But a coup might be an attempted coup. Uh, a putsch, sorry, is an attempted coup. Uh, and that's why it is sometimes, uh, and it is not finished coup, as, 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 as you have uh, uh, witnessed and followed the, the, the news. That's why uh, the interpreter or the translator did not translate it as al-inqilab. Because al-inqilab is najiz here. ناجز هنا ولم ينجز هذا الانقلاب في نهايته but what is meant here is the monopoly of power by the army in Sudan and in other African uh, states so here in the sense of the rebel تمرد الجيش على السلطة المدنية تمرد السلطة العسكرية على السلطة المدنية وأتينا بها سجعا التمرد والتفرد والتفرد Shaf to push what because this might be the title. The army's takeover in Sudan highlights a worrying trend. Tasallat al Jaysh ala Sudan yurasikhu nizat al Muzia, jihadism and great power competition. Competition tenefus al Quwa al Uzma. I would say tenefus in Arabic would not mean that because the tenefus wa asisan fil khair. This is culturally speaking. At taraghubu fil khair. So it is for the good. It is a competition for the good in Arabic, unlike English. That's why we opted for tadahur al-qwa al-uzma. وهو تداحر غير معلن أحياناً. وتناف تنافس فيه تداحر على الدول الأفريقية من الصين والولايات المتحدة الأمريكية, China, Russia, United States, and the European Union, and so on. So here, this is the first uh, another example. The other example, in May, the last border uh, outpost between Syria and Iraq, still controlled by the regime, and President Bashar al-Assad fell to the Mujahideen of the Islamic State. Mujahideen in English, so the original text is in English here. One of the interpreters translated it as Mujahideen al dawla al-Islamiyya. Here, Mujahidu, Mujahidun al-Filistiniyun, this is also positive. So I think we can uh, uh, introduce some judicial, judicious intervention and translate it by jihadiyin akthar, more pejorative. Uh, let's move on. The world's most powerful man. World, al-alam, in Arabic. But here we can interpret it as al-ard. أقوى رجل على وجه الأرض لنقول وجه العالم أو في العالم وجه الأرض أفضل uh, النكبة النكبة might be translated as calamity, disaster um, catastrophe but also can be translated as a نكبة if it refers to a, an incident in history with the Palestinians so we keep it because it marks 
some incident uh, in the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. Here, uh, a sheikh, depending on the context and the, the diplomatic context in particular, might be uh, religious uh, title, uh, Sheikh Al-Azhar, the Sheikh, and it remains here Sheikh Al-Azhar, uh, or Sheikh Al-Islam, for example, Ibn Taymiyyah, وهذا اللقب يطلق أساسا على الفقهاء فقهاء ورجال العلم. so here we translate it as a scholar of Islam, scholar of Islam. when I say sumo sheikh like in Kuwait for example, so his his highness, his highness or his majesty sometimes his highness sheikh صباح الأحمد صباح for example. now Let's move on now. Or sometimes the plural, Sheikh of Mashaykh, and when it is plural of Mashaykh, this is the religious. So these are the scholars. Scholars and the Imams. We can translate them as Imams. Imams of Zaytuna, Mashaykh Zaytuna. And uh, here, depending on the context and the uh, whether it is religious, political, and uh, um, general, we can translate. Um, another text or conference Jordan urged to stop imprisoning women for defying the wishes of men. And here I would like to focus on defying the wishes of men. And here we opted for عصينة. الرجال أو عصينة بعولتهن. البعولة. So men can be translated as بعولتهن. This is culturally we can... Uh, make the adaptation to the um, uh, Arabic culture. And here, by the way, this is a back translation when you state it in English. Again, دعت منظمة العفو الدولية الأردنية الغاء العمل بنظام الوصاية الذكورية التي تراه deemed inappropriate. تراه نظاما مهينا أو جائرا إذا ما أقدمت المرأة على عصيان أمر الرجل أو بعدها عصيان أمر. هنا إذا ما بنت علاقة رآها الرجل غير لائقة inappropriate it is really very problematic to translate inappropriate language indecent language indecent etc because it is loaded with cultural weight and I'm not going to discuss here الوصاية الولي والقيم والوكيل and so on this is especially in legal culture this is really rich discussion and I have uh, made that discussion with my students. Now, another example. What refugees face on their treacherous? Uh, uh, can you hear me quite well now? Just, just a check. Yes, we do. We hear you very well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so here, what refugees face on their treacherous journey. Here the interpreter can have recourse to a technique called explicitation to make something implicit explicit which it's implicitly uh, expressed in English what refugees face means الأهوال أهوال الرحلة نترجمها أي أهوال تنتظر اللاجئين في رحلتهم المحفوفة بالمخاطر مثلا وهكذا. Uh, another example. حكومة السراج تزج بنفسها في صراع دولي إرضاء للميليشيات وخدمة لأهداف إردوغان. The Sarraj government is now sinking or plunging itself ever deeper into an international conflict to the satisfaction. To the satisfaction. من السهل المنتنع هذا. Of militia groups and in the service of Erdogan's أهداف هنا أجندة. بمعنى الأجندة. Interpreted as agenda. Uh, another example, refugees risked everything to make this treacherous journey. خاطر اللاجئون بحياتهم وبكل ما يملكون ورموا بأنفسهم في آتون هذه الرحلة. آتون نأتي بها لأنها تعبر هنا عن هذا المعنى وكأنها نار سيحرقون فيها في هذه الرحلة المحفوفة بالمخاطر. Another example, Pakistan's Supreme Court has struck down the death sentence for blasphemy. And here the word is blasphemy on folks here, uh, handed over. Here, the Prophet ﷺ, in the case of 
ترجمت ذيز را ايلي government had the blood of the Palestinians killed in Sheikh Jarrah يعني ونقول الحكومة الإسرائيلية ملطخة بدماء الفلسطينيين أو أيديها ملطخة بدماء الفلسطينيين الذين يمكن أن نقول استشهدوا في حي الشيخ جراح Another example attempting to cover its past crimes such as the use of comfort women by the army. Comfort women, he is very problematic to translate. It is really cultural. Comfort women, turjimat ala anha nisa al But I think we need to revisit the translation to, uh, in a sense, in a sense, reflect that cultural uniqueness of the term comfort women. Break into a maximum security prison. Security ليس فقط الأمن. هنا security can be interpreted as الحراسة. اقتحام سجن شديد الحراسة. التحقق من صحة الادعاءات. هنا التحقق بمعنى to ascertain. This is technical term. الصحة هنا ليس بمعنى accuracy. This is general vocabulary term. Here it's the validity. And the ادعاءات allegations. And sometimes we say الادعاءات الباطلة malicious false allegations أو الادعاءات فيها تجني malicious allegations in the legal culture cultural context. The other example ISIS saw death and destruction. يزرع تزرعت داعش الموت والدمار ويمكن أن نغير أيضا الزراعة لأن الزراعة يعني جيدة أن نزرع الشيء زرع قنابل أو زرع I don't think this is the right term to use because الزراعة أحيانا نقول يزرع ما يحصد أو يحصد ما يزرع عفوا وزراعة قد تكون شوك أيضا but it is used in the Arabic culture for something good so I do prefer to change that the other uh, example, mouthings, lies, and fabrications. Turjimat al tasrihat siyasi al gariba mouthings. Here, this is not really very much successful. Mouthings when you speak just lip service in a way. Lays uh, al gariba, but here, uh, just saying nothing. Al akadib, wal iftiraat. We do, we do accept it now. With that, these examples, I would like to check with you uh, another term and word, which is resolution. And here, I would like to call Safa to display the, uh, the uh, graph on resolution. Resolution has been studied in one of my uh, uh, papers uh, in a parallel corpse. How to resolution is being translated in that corpse into Arabic and then those uh, target words how they have been back translated into English and those back translations into back back translation back into Arabic so I would like to uh, I'm not going to focus on that but uh, the the um, target words are uh, displayed استشراب استبانة تسوية قرار حل تسوية etc. Now I'm going to move on with another example example of Erez crossing I have been called to interpret a sensitive meeting confidential meeting of mediation between Israelis and Palestinians and the mediation was conducted by a European country a government of a European country. The, so the mediator was a, a former ambassador of that state into Jordan. And I had no clue about the subject at the time, and except for uh, the, the general topic on water resources and so on, they were going to discuss. And the uh, mediator said the following, and now we move on to discuss the problems pertaining to the Erez crossing, 
I interpreted it والآن نمر لنتباحث بشأن معبر إيريس And here the Palestinian delegate really stood up and protested against the interpreter who was myself stating هذا ما هو معبر إسرائيلي هذا معبر بيت حنون هذا معبر فلسطيني and I apologized and later on after the meeting he followed me the guy from Gaza and he told me uh, apologies it was not you who was meant by the protest dear friend and I knew that so here you need to uh, act and use some good offices and understand with experience that you were not the targeted person at that moment because it was a criticism for the mediator for being biased. Now, I will end with another story. Last week, I was interpreting in a high-level meeting. Yes. Can we break the break because we have the time to break the time? Yes. One minute and one minute. Thank you. Thank you. I was uh, interpreting in a high-level meeting. It were, was uh, in the judiciary, a judicial uh, official, and he happened to be from Algeria. And they were discussing some issues with European counterparts. Now, the European delegate stated the following, I don't promise that we will fix the problems overnight and that uh, there will be a heaven on earth and spring will be back. And the interpreter translated it as follows. So this is a sort of an, a judicious intervention by the interpreter. Now, when he took the floor, the Arab official, the Algerian official, he stated the following. And uh, I really understand that. Uh, so, uh, I we certainly uh, uh, do understand that we would love only to see the birds surviving and spring will come eventually. So here, this is a very good example of that intervention. And the interpreter has to clarify later on to the delegate that the metaphor of birds, how it is used in the Arabic culture. And this is really... Uh, was very well received by the by the European delegate, and I will end with a quote. Last word about interpreting. The last slide, please. Interpreting looks two ways. It opens up a passage and a heart, drawing near what might always remain afar. And thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention and apologies for the internet issues. And I am really uh, keen uh, and, and I can take questions in English, Arabic or French. Thank you very much. And back to you, Dr. Blaiba. Blaib. Shukran. Thank you. شكرا جزيلا لك استاذ بورك فيك على المداخله القيمه وهذا العرض المميز. سواء من خلال الصور أو من خلال الفيديوهات التي قدمتها والشروحات بالأمثلة من مختلف اللغات وترجمتها إلى غير ذلك فأعتقد بأنها يعني لاحظت أنه حتى من خلال يعني الحضور وما علقوا عليها الكثير أعجبتهم المداخلة وهنالك بعض الأسئلة فمن بين ال الملاحظات أجد مثلاً actually Mr. Hamouda I can't get enough of your talk this is so interesting and what a great experience you have وغيرها الكثير من المداخلات والتعليقات كانت 
مداخلات قيمة لا أدري إن كان هنالك أسئلة يمكن للحضور أن يطرحوها الآن في قسم المحادثة وسننقلها إلى الأستاذ حمودة أو إلى سيسيليا التي لا تزال متواجدة معنا فيمكننا نقلها شفهياً <تصفيق>